John Cola with OKRaw.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you coming at you from my beautiful backyard garden here. And we're going to answer your guys' questions today. I apologize. I have over like a million subscribers or followers on my different social media outlets. So I can't take any questions directly. But if you do have a question that you would like to ask me that may get answered in next month's Q&A on this channel, make sure you post it under the comments tab. I have a pinned comment there that says ask John your questions here so ask your questions away under that comment and I may choose it for inclusion in next month's Q&A anyways on with this Q&A first question is from Dirk Z's 8 how do you feel about pickling vegetables we use vinegar to pickle our cucumbers and hot peppers so they last longer we have to use heat to seal the jar so technically the veggies are being cooked but they are in a sealed jar we also use the vinegar from the jars to season our salads. Any thoughts on if we could do things to preserve our veggies better, or do you think pickling is okay? So here's the thing, I encourage you guys to actually eat more plant foods. You know, freshest is bestest, and then actually even over and above pickling, which it's, it's extremely rare that I ever eat anything pickled, being that it's vinegar brined to kind of get the acidity level down. What I would recommend for you guys is actually do lactic acid fermentation. So basically you're creating a live food, a probiotic food versus just a food stored in vinegar that has been heat processed to remove the enzymes. When you're fermenting your food, you're creating bacteria, you're creating enzymatic activity, you're creating something that will actually feed your microbiome and even, according to scientific studies, make inflammatory markers in your body go down. And once you ferment food, then you could, uh, you know, store it in the fridge. That's the downside to it. You could store it maybe in a cold cellar, um, you know, at a colder temperature for longer. But it's not going to have the shelf life that pickles in vinegar that have been heat processed would, which you're going to store a lot longer. That being said, it's going to be a lot more health beneficial for you to eat the fermented, you know, pickles or hot peppers, you know, instead of the vinegared ones, right? That being said, if you guys do choose to use the vinegar ones, hey, that's better than not eating the vegetables at all, all right? Um, I would encourage you guys to use not just the standard, you know, cheap white vinegar. Those things are garbage, man. Like, at least get some good quality vinegar, minimum some organic apple cider vinegar or something like that to, you know, do your pickled vegetables in. All right, so next question is from KJ. Hi, John. My question for you is, do you ever walk by a mainstream restaurant and catch a whiff of something cooking that, and think, wow, that smells so good? Um, not usually. So, so like most restaurants I go by, I'm smelling the, 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 the smell of like meat grilling. And to me, that tastes horrid. I mean, that's like charred flesh. It's gross to me personally. Now, if you're a meat eater, you probably love that smell. You know, now sometimes I may walk by a restaurant, you know, maybe I'm in a, staying in a hotel and I got the, you know, I'm above the, where they cook the breakfast and I smell all the bacon and eggs and I hate that smell too. <laughs> On rare occasion, I might go by like a pizza place and smell some pizza and like it might bring up memories of how it used to be when I used to eat traditional pizza back in the day. But I don't really have any desire for that food because I don't consider it food that I personally choose to eat. Now, if you guys want to eat it, hey, you guys can eat whatever you guys want. I choose to eat my own raw pizzas. Link down below to my Instagram where you guys can see raw pizzas. I made a whole bunch of pizza crusts out of the cauliflower that I grew in my garden over the winter. All right. So my next question is from Ali. Hi, John. What do you think about fruitarian diet? Thanks so much. All right, Ali. You're, you're setting me up here. So, you know, it depends. How do you define a fruitarian diet, right? If you say a fruitarian diet is 100% pure fruit, including sweet fruits and non-sweet fruits, right? I've rarely ever seen that work successfully in the long term. Furthermore, based on like new microbiome science, right? One of the main criteria for having a healthy microbiome is eating a diversity of foods. And when you are restricting your diet just to just fruits, whether sweet and or non-sweet fruits, you know, oh man, that's going to make it, in my opinion, increasingly difficult to make a nice microbiome because your microbiome needs all different kinds of fibers, prebiotic fibers, inulin, fruto, oleosaccharides, 
um, galacto oleosaccharides, all these different things have a nice balanced gut, you know. Can it work for a limited period of time? Can you go on a cleanse, on a fruitarian cleanse for a while? Yes, you absolutely can. That being said, personally, my money is more on the greens. You know, I recently saw or heard about my friend's microbiome test who eats a predominantly green diet with, yes, he eats fruits too. And, you know, his microbiome diversity was great. So I, I think, you, you know, you could definitely have some good microbiome um, diversity if you eat a well-rounded and well-planned out diet. It's unfortunate that many fruitarian diets I see may not be the best planned or they may not be eating the highest quality food. And there's many factors that will determine if you will succeed or fail on a fruitarian diet, including how you define it, you know. So if you're eating a fruitarian diet, but that includes as many vegetables, including root vegetables and leafy green vegetables, and not just tender leafy green vegetables that you like, that could be perfectly healthy, provided you're getting a lot of nice variety. And when's the last time a raw vegan, you know, ate some sunchokes or drew some artichokes, they are one of the most beneficial microbiome foods that I don't see a lot of raw vegans or fruitarians eat, and actually they're tubers. All right, next question is from Sidewalk Chemistry. Since you began introducing cooked foods in your diet, I was curious if you considered Arnold Errett's mucilage healing system approach. Have you ever tried it? Yeah, so back in the day when I started a raw vegan diet, once again, I've been doing this for 28 years now, started back in 1995. I read Arnold Errett's mucilage diet healing system book, cover to cover, you know, end to end. And you know, here's the thing, guys. That book is now 100 years old, right? And the fact of the matter is that knowledge written in the book 100 years ago has not changed. You know, if you read that book 100 years ago or even 90 years ago, 80 years ago, 70 years ago, you know, when I got into this 28 years ago, I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense to me. But knowing what I have know now, and I mean, I, I try to keep up with as much science and publish journal studies as I can on, you know, eating a healthy diet and improving your immune system, my immune system, because that's because I almost lost my life due to immune system um, complications when I was younger. You know, I do not personally believe that that system makes the best of sense these days. Now, the fact of the matter is that it may work for you. It, it has helped a lot of people, thousands of people, I'll say. But here's the thing. Could it be done better? by just not being so restrictive, you know? And that is the question, right? I would say yes. D hardcore, die-hard Arnold Errett people would say no, right? <laughs> but I, my money is more on the new emerging science that actually they, they, they study in labs and test tubes and do different studies to study populations and see how long-lived people like live and what their microbiome looks like than just a guy that wrote a book 100 years ago that did not have all the information that's available today. Now, you might think, John, you overthink it, man. And, you know, that's your right to think that I'm a crazy loon or whatever because I actually look and read the science. I encourage you guys to look up and read the science. Easy to access, guys. Scholar.google.com. Start, you know, searching for these things in Burt Journal Published Studies and start reading them and to see what you're going to read and see what you're going to learn, right? In general, you're going to kind of learn what I've learned by reading many studies, right? We want to eat a predominantly plant-based diet for sure. You know, the studies don't necessarily to say eat all raw, but I'll still say, coming from a raw food diet background, that raw is the best foods in most cases, and the majority of my diet is still raw plants, fruits, and vegetables dominated. I ate so many lettuces out of my garden and spinaches today and processed them today so I could dry them. You know, because that's what I grow, that's what I eat, and that's what I encourage you guys to eat. But also, more importantly, let's not forget about other foods that may need to be heat processed, beans and rice, potatoes and sweet potatoes, things like mushrooms that probably are better cooked than raw, that can also have major health benefits. Check the Check link down below for my video on why I started heat processing my food and including some small amounts of cooked foods in my diet. Next question is from Plants on Purpose. What advice would you give a six-year vegan eating whole food plant-based just staring out on their raw journey? All right, Plants on Purpose. I, I love that you are starting a raw vegan journey and you came from a whole food plant-based diet. The first thing I'm going to tell you is that to me, like 
it's definitely good to include more raw fruits and vegetables in your whole food plant-based diet because I believe most people on our whole food plant-based diet generally cook too much foods and more importantly over-process the foods and heat process the foods in ways that create carcinogens. As coming from a raw food diet, you know, the main thing was like in the beginning was like don't heat anything over 118 degrees or if you have an excavator dehydrator, you know, 111 degrees, whatever, 105 you know, so, and that's just one criteria, but the other things I'll say is that, you know, aside from that criteria, to me what it's turned into is just turned into about like minimally processing your food. Yes, temperature is one aspect, although I heat process my food, and now I'm just going to say, you know, try to eat as much food as you can raw, minimally processed, but it depends on what nutrient you're going after and what, what specific nutrient in the food is important to you, right? Dehydrating foods at a high temperature are going to keep more antioxidants, but dehydrating them at a low temperature may keep more enzymes, right? So you get to choose, right? If you guys, if you're still heat processing food, I would say use an instant pot. To me, that's the easiest and healthiest way to heat process foods. And because you are going raw, to really particularly concern yourself with how are you processing the foods that you're eating, you know, quote unquote raw, right? So instead of using a high-speed juicer, which I still see many raw vegans use, get a slow juicer. Instead of just using a traditional blender that oxidizes the food, that lowers the nutrition quality, and dare I say, I do not consider blended foods raw because it's really destroying a lot of the nutrients in there, despite potentially speeding up enzyme reactions, right? I want you guys to vacuum blend. There's new technologies that you could maximize the nutrients that you're in your foods that you're preparing by just using different equipment. Of course, the best equipment, of course, of all are our teeth. So I want you guys to chew your raw foods well. You know, when things are cooked, they don't need to be chewed as well because they're, the cell walls are broken open by the cooking process. Honestly, juicing and blending break open cell walls. You should still chew your juice or chew your smoothies and mix the saliva up in there and get it down in you. And the other thing I'll say is that, you know, because you are coming from a plant-based whole food background, I don't want you guys to just move away from the whole food plant-based and then just go on entirely to raw. I don't personally think that's necessarily the healthiest thing. Number one, you're going to have some really bad microbiome or stomach upset because if you're just switching your diet overnight, your microbiome and your gut, they're just going to react negatively. So I'd say go slowly. You know, If you're eating whole food plant-based and 90% is cooked and 10% is raw, man, up that to 20% raw this month. Then go to 30, 40, 50 I'd say, man, up it to like 80% raw and still keep, you know, the healthiest of the healthy 20%, you know, heat processed foods and heat process it like in the Instant Pot. And on a raw vegan diet, I want to encourage you guys not to forget about your vegetables. Many people on a raw vegan diet may gravitate towards fruits because they're a high calorie food and we need to get our calories. Don't get me wrong. But it, you're, you need to have the right balance of fruits to vegetables for you. I found for me that definitely having more vegetables than fruits is what works best for me these days. Although when I was younger, I was able to eat a lot more fruits than I am, than I, than I am currently. So, you know, I think paying attention to what you need, your body needs, and how you're reacting to these foods. I think fruit is great and we want to eat as much fruit as we'd like. But the most important thing is don't forget about the vegetables. What I'm going to say minimally is for every one pound of fruit you eat, I want you guys to eat one pound of vegetables. And if you're eating like three pounds of fruit and one pound of vegetables, you know, then I'd maybe reduce some of the fruit and increase the vegetables. So that's what I'll say. And then also the other, the final thing I'm going to say is don't forget about the leafy greens. I'm surrounded with leafy greens in my garden. It's the number one powerhouse food. And if you can't grow your own leafy greens, at least minimally grow sprouts or microgreens in your house. All right. Next question is from Godly Vegan. God bless you, John. What's your favorite restaurant in Las Vegas, and which green powder are you taking? <laughs> All right. Favorite restaurant in Las Vegas. I don't have one. I don't go out. My favorite restaurant is right here in my backyard. When I want to eat a salad, I come out and cut down a lettuce. <laughs> I wash it. I cut it up. I make a salad dressing, and I eat it. It's extremely rare that I ever eat out in Las Vegas. The last place I ate out at was that, what, the Heavenly Vegan when they had like open restaurant service, they're usually, a, they're usually like a meal on demand or meal prep place where you put in an order and they'll make all the meals and you, 
you pick it up once a week and they did have a restaurant so like I, I ate there several years ago so if they are still open that'd be my favorite place but that being said I haven't eaten there in several years actually I really don't eat out you know to me like most of the restaurants in Vegas like they may be, there's a lot of vegan places and they're opening up more and more which is great I think it's great to open more vegan places and more people can embrace eating more plant foods even if they're highly processed it, but it's just not for me <laughs> so that's what I'll say so what green powder are you taking so I take several green powders today I had some wheatgrass powder um, ju juice powder from now foods I could also take a barley grass powder and my favorite powder is the vitamin mineral green powder by health force nutritionals all right next question is from uh, Sark NYT how in the heck do I store the food I've dehydrated I'm at a loss all right, so to store dehydrated food, the most important thing is you want to, number one, remove the oxygen and take it out of just open air storage, depending on where you live. Like if you live in Hawaii, you take stuff out of the dehydrator. The minute you take it out, the, the dehydrated food is now rehydrating because your humidity in the air is basically going back into the food because there's less humidity in the food. You know, luckily I live in an arid climate, so when I take things out of the dehydrator, things don't rehydrate as quickly because it's already so dry and some cases I could leave like cherry tomatoes on the counter here and they'll literally dehydrate before they go moldy some will go moldy but mostly they'll dehydrate so you want to get them out of the open air environment the easiest thing is storm in a mason jar and then pull a vacuum on it with a vacuum lid you know I have videos on vacuum storing your foods you know, and it depends, honestly, how long you want to store them. You could put them in a Ziploc bag. You know, I put some kale chips in a Ziploc bag right next to where I sit down and watch TV. So when I'm hungry and watching TV, I could open up the Ziploc bag and then eat them. You know, that's just, a, you know, I use Mylar zipper bags. So if you guys are really hardcore and want to store your dehydrated foods for longer, then you want to use a Mylar bag because that doesn't let, you know, oxygen transfer in and out as much as a standard Ziploc plastic bag would. And then if you want to store it for even longer, although I don't necessarily recommend storing dehydrated foods for that long, especially if you've done it at a low temperature because there's more enzymatic activity, um, you shouldn't store maybe most dehydrated foods for um, like a year, like max maybe. You want to put an oxygen absorber in there. So put an oxygen absorber in there, put in a Mylar bag with a nice thick mill. I think I use like seven and a half mil uh, Mylar bags and with an oxygen absorber and then suck the air out of that and then you could store it for a longer term use. All right, so hope that helps you out there. Next question is from Marlene Janzik. How you cooking lentils, kidney beans, flaglets, potatoes? Do you know something about combination food? Thanks for the quality and cleverness of your shared dogma is clearly a trap. All right, Marlene, I like you. You're cool. All right, so how I cook lentils, kidney beans, I don't really cook flagolets, but that's some other kind of like small bean and potatoes. So I cook all these things in the instant pot. Makes cooking super simple, super easy, and every different bean takes a little bit different time. So generally if I'm cooking lentils, I'll take the raw lentils, I'll just soak them in water in like a mason jar with a vacuum lid. So I'll pull a vacuum on it so that does like a power soak because it forces the water in there. And then I could cook most lentils for maybe like 8 to 10 minutes. Kidney beans, I'll do that same soaking technique. Probably should do it overnight or minimum 4 hours minimally. And then that kidney beans need to be cooked like seriously. And I um, cook them in the Instant Pot uh, like just submerged underwater using the appropriate amount of water. Same with the other beans. Um, for like the kidney beans could be like 40 minutes or 50 minutes depending. And then the flaglets, I don't know what, what beans those are, but depending on the bean, I'll just like Google search it. How long is it to cook, you know, whatever flaglet beans or what navy beans in the Instant Pot. And I'll see some websites and it says 30 minutes. So then, okay, I'll just do 30 minutes or whatever it is, right? Potatoes, generally I do not buy rusted potatoes. It's rare. I mean, if, I, if they were like throwing them away because they're like in the compost bin at the, you know, health food store and they give them away for free, I might take it. Um, if it, and if it's good, I'll still cook it, but mostly my dog eats them. But I'll usually try to get the smaller baby to, uh, potatoes. Uh, my favorites are the purples. I got some really cool red ones right now also. And then those I could put in the Instant Pot for like up to eight minutes. So six to eight minutes. If they're really smaller, I could even do like five minutes. And sometimes I'll just basically chop them up into cubes and then I'll add it with greens and then put it in the Instant Pot. I could cook it for as short as like two minutes on the high setting. 
So yeah, that's pretty much it. They're super easy to cook these things, like doesn't take rocket science, and it's perfect for a bachelor like me. Do you know about something about combination food? So I'm not sure if you mean like combinate, adding, you know, putting rice and beans together, cooking them together, which I also do in the Instant Pot. I'll cook rice and beans at the same time in the same water. And instead of using water, in many cases, I'll just use like juice. Like I usually have always extra juice and I'll actually use the juice to cook my beans and rice or, you know, the beans only in after I soak them in a water that I then discard or put on my plants. Um, and then so food combinations like putting, you know, this with this, is that what you mean? Like when you're cooking them or do you mean, you know, food combining when you eat them? So, you know, to me, like I've never really um, needed to food combine my food. So I don't go by food combining rules when I make things. That being said, I do try to, you know, eat things that are alike, you know, so it's rare that I'll eat something like uh, mangoes with oranges, you know, like a sweet fruit and an acid fruit or something like that. I try to keep things like together, you know, so it's rare you'll see me do like a banana orange juice smoothie, for example. You know, I'm, I'm more likely to do like a sugar cane, banana, strawberry smoothie, for example. So, you know, I don't really need to do that. I did have a gr ex-girlfriend that really, really needed to watch and do her food combining or else she would she would not feel well. That being said, my personal opinion these days is that while food combining can help many people, what, what's the underlying reason on why you need to food combine and why it is so important to you that you can't digest food, you know, if it's not in the right combination? And I would say potentially the microbiome may be a culprit or may be a factor. I don't know. All right, wow, we're down to the last question today. It's from Nicole Sherrod, and it's long. Hey, John, can you talk about plant toxins and if we should avoid them, lectins and oxalates? I'm not vegan, but I enjoy watching your channel. I do love animals, but I think we should all be eating plants, juicing too, so meats plus veggies. I think we should all stop eating processed food, limit the fruit. I think high-carb fruit causes metabolic diseases, obesity, cancer. Cancer lives off sugar and glutamine. I want to try eating a diet of quality protein, quality fat, and green juices and healthy vegetables like cruciferous. I haven't always been good about my vegetables, but I made a green juice of the day, and it was delicious. I'm trying to cure my diabetes, insulin resistance, and lose weight. So I'm skipping fruit for now until I get to where I need to be. That's why I ask, how do vegans eat so much fruit? And do you count your sugars and carbs when you eat fruit? I'm asking because how do people with obesity and metabolic disease include fruit? Sorry, guess this is more than one question. All right, Nicole. So first about, you asked about plant toxins and if we should avoid them. Lectins and, lectins and oxalates. I have a link down below to the video I'll post if I remember where I really go into detail about these plant toxins right? And I'll sum it up. I'll sum that whole video up. Plant toxins, in my personal opinion, are not here for us. They're there for the plant, right? I was eating some of the lettuce out of this bed today, and it was tasting rather bitter, and I was eating that white sap that comes off the stem of the lettuce after I plucked it out, right? Those are plant toxins, right? I feel fine after eating them, right? That being said, each person needs to assess their specific situation, right? Some people can deal with plant toxins more than others. That being said, another thing that's very important besides how much plant toxins can you deal with, right? I'm used to eating these bitter things out of my garden for like, like the last 15 years, right? I've been eating these bitter things and I've, my body is getting used to it. But if I just started eating it today, maybe I'd vomit. I don't really know. That being said, you know, I like to look at traditional processing methods of foods, right? People back in the day, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, didn't have all the research or data that we had now. And they need to use, they had to find out methods that they would cook or heat process or process their food in some special way, soaking it and then drying it or whatever it is to reduce some of the toxins so that they wouldn't get the negative effects from these toxins. So we need to look at, you know, how did peoples that ate these foods for hundreds of years, you know, thousands of years even, process these foods to minimize the toxins and then be able to eat them without having any problems. I think there's a, a whole bunch of camps online that really make these plant toxins out to be these evil villains, right? And like, I don't agree with that, right? Plant toxins should be highly respected, right? They're not something to scoff at. They can kill you, 
right? Kidney beans, if you don't cook them, they're undercooked, could make you really sick and kill you, right? I had a friend that sprouted them and she got really sick because she was trying to eat them raw. Not everything could be eaten raw, guys, and that's, you know, one of the reasons for the heat process and could break down some of the toxins, also make starches more complex, make it better for our microbiome, so many different things. The other thing is that some of the plant toxins in scientific published studies have shown to be disease preventative and you know, kill things like cancer and whatnot. So if you avoid plant toxins, then you're going to limit your ability to, you know, maybe prevent cancer and heal from different diseases because now you're limiting certain ingredients in the plant foods that in appropriate levels may be beneficial for us. In high levels, they're not good for us. So that's why you need to process your foods accordingly and always pay attention. So yeah, so that's my summary on that. So I don't think we should necessarily avoid them, but we should respect them, process them properly so that we could eat them in such low amounts so that they can may be beneficial for us. The other thing I think that's very important is to not eat the same plant toxin every single day or every single week for that matter. If you guys are going to the store and buying organic spinach mix every single week, week in, week out, eating a box of spinach every week or maybe even more than one box of spinach every week, you're eating oxalates like on a regular and everyday basis, right? I encourage you guys to eat seasonally, right? I have spinach in my garden right now. I had, I had a spinach earlier, right? The spinach is going to be out of season in about a month. I'm not going to eat spinach for the rest of the year until next year when I grow it again. However, I will eat other foods that contain oxalates, but not in any large amounts, you know? So that's, I think that's the other thing we forget. We really want to do a lot of rotation in our diet so that we never get too much of any one kind of plant toxin in us, but get a nice spread of different kinds of plant toxins that can benefit us when used appropriately and not overeaten. That's, that's a summary on that. So then in the next question you have, you talk about like, um, I want to comment on one thing. It says, I think we should all be eating, we should all stop eating processed food. I agree. I mean, meat eaters and keto people and vegans alike, well, not all vegans, but whole food plant-based vegans think we've got to get rid of the processed food and I'm glad we all agree on that point. The other thing you said, it says, I do love animals, but I think we should all be eating plants, juicing too, so meats plus veggies. So I would, I would encourage you to change that around. Instead of meats plus veggies, that's what the standard American person does. They eat meats plus some veggies, and they've gotten into a lot of trouble doing that, especially the quality of the meats, unless you're you know, going out and hunting your own deer, which I know vegans on my channel would, would staunchly disagree with me saying or encouraging. But, you know, I, I try to teach you guys good, better, best. You know, one of the, my beliefs is that if you want to eat meat, you should kill your own meat, right? Have pet chickens and slit their throats. It sounds mean and cruel, but I personally believe that, like, most people honestly would not be able to kill another animal, especially after you raised it as your own. Like, I would never be able to kill my dog, and I would never want to eat him either. Like, it's just not appetizing, and it would make me really sad. Just I'm tearing up just thinking about it, right? So, you know, I really think there's a big disconnection with the foods, not only the fruits and vegetables that I grow myself, I know what goes into growing them, what goes into processing them, the whole gamut. You know, I, I think that people are so disconnected from animals. And if you want to eat meat, hey, go out and kill them yourself, have your pets and slit their throats and process them yourself. More power to you. That being said, you know, meats, in my opinion, should not be meats plus veggies. It should be vegetables and plant-based diet plus a little bit of animal foods, right? Meats, for example, right, should be 10% of your calories or less, preferably like 5%, if you want to be healthy. Too much meat, in my opinion, and based on the scientific studies that I've seen and reviewed, is not healthy and is going to lead to greater disease um, in the long run, if that is important. If it's not important, you don't really care about your health, eat as much meat as you want and party until the day you drop. I just want people to know the truth, and based on what I've learned, that is the truth. <laughs> so, if, I mean, if I think if everybody on the planet eat like 90% plants and 10% meat, right, what kind of world would we have? We wouldn't need, you know, 10% of the population to go 100% vegan if we got the majority of the population to go 90% plant-based, whole food, and 10% animal products. That'd be amazing. So, yeah, and then the next thing you talk about, like, Talk about diabetes and metabolic disease and eating fruit. So here's the thing. I don't count my calories. I don't count the amount of fruit I eat. You know, I eat as much fruit as I want. Usually my goal every day is to eat one fruit meal a day, right? Could be jackfruit. Today I had 
bunch of mangoes and some strawberries, right? I had my green juice, had a salad, and actually after this video, I'm going to eat something else, right? So I don't really count that stuff. And what I will say is that I'm no diabetes expert, but I'll recommend you guys to the, I'll recommend to you the people that are diabetes experts that eat a lot of fruit, that eat a whole food plant-based diet and have helped thousands of people reverse their diabetes, have written a book on this topic. It's Matt, my friends, Robbie Barbero at Mastering Diabetes, right? Uh, Robbie and Cyrus at Mastering Diabetes, masteringdiabetes.org, I believe, or com. You know, those guys are great. Those are the guys you guys want to listen to if you guys got diabetes. You know, Robbie has a type 1 diabetic and he eats a majority of fruit diet, which I personally think he should probably include some more vegetables. He's eating a bit too much fruit. But, um, you know, hey, more power to him. He's doing what he's doing. And he, he takes very little insulin, even though his body does not produce any. So, yeah, check out Robbie and Cyrus at MasteringDiabetes.com for their techniques to basically reverse type 2 diabetes as well as probably metabolic disease at the same time it's all connected so yeah that's pretty much it for this month's q a if you guys enjoy this month's q a hey please be sure to give this video a big thumbs up share this with others you guys could think it could help and also be sure to post your question at the comments tab on my channel here on youtube if you you would like your question to be potentially answered in next month's q a also, be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss my new upcoming episodes of Coming Out Every 5 to 7 Days. You never know where I'll show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. Make sure you click the little bell so you get notified as my new videos go out. And finally, be sure to check my past episodes. The past episodes are a wealth and large. Over 600 episodes at this time on this channel dedicated to teaching you guys about eating more fresh fruits and vegetables and other plant foods so that you guys can get healthier. So with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. Until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best. Oh,